the stories we tell each other and the stories we tell ourselves matter. They make a difference. They make us different. They make us feel differently. They make us act and interact differently. Stories are the operating instructions. We tell stories, but they tell us how to be. Welcome to the Non-Servium Podcast, a project dedicated to exploring the world of anarchist and anti-authoritarian ideas. Join us in our conversations with radical voices in precarious times. To view our full catalog, visit our website at nonserviummedia.com. If you'd like to support the show, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash nonserviummedia. Remember to like, share, and subscribe to help spread the word. And so you can stay updated with our most recent episodes. Thank you for tuning in. We hope you enjoy. Hey there, everyone. Welcome to the Non-Servium Podcast. I'm your host, Joel Williamson, and you are listening to the 35th episode of the show. Today's episode is about narrative, emancipation, and the tools we use to construct prisons and tear them down. Here's my interview with Travid Halton. Travid Halton is an anarchist archaeologist from Houston, Texas, who comes from a working class background and got his undergraduate degree in anthropology and biology from the University of Houston. He works as an archaeologist and has done academic archaeological work in Scandinavia and across the U.S. with a specialization in the native peoples of the Texas coast. An avid autodidact, Travid has interests in the Germanic language family the technologies of pre-industrial people, the history of working class emancipation, and the new art and media that explores the experience of wonder in the human situation. He also was one of the core organizers of an event called Roja of a Strong that non serviu Media covered. Travid, welcome to the show. Hey Joel, thanks for having me. Absolutely. I'm glad you could make it. You drove all the way from Houston to come here. I did. And... I'm glad you made it here safe. This is the this is the second time that I've ever interviewed someone in person like this for the podcast. The first time we did this was with our mutual friend and brother, Clay Zobalak, who, as you know, uh, helped me write a lot of the questions that I plan to ask you today. So I, I'm... Uh, don't normally get to have this kind of intimate experience with someone. I'm usually connecting with them through the internet. So I'm so glad that you can be here in person. Yeah, me too. It's really cozy. Yeah, you should describe this setting for, for everybody. Absolutely. So we are sitting at my dinner table right now with two emotional support plants, one to my left and one to Travis <laughs> left. And we have a stack of David Graeber books. We have some vegan Halloween candy, <laughs> and a candle lit right now. Uh, Travid is drinking some Ricea. Actually, this one is a, a mezcal. It's a bottle of uh, Vita. It's all the same to me. Just <laughs> <laughs> I kept calling when I was interviewing Clay. I kept calling the Ricea tequila, and he's like, he kept correcting me. I was like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> I was like, I, I, I'm, I'm not drinking the mezcal because I am... I am about two days away from being a year alcohol free. Awesome, um, it's up as poison. It is poison, but it's very good poison <laughs> that probably helped build civilization. And maybe we can talk about civilization yeah. a little later. I don't know about the relationship between alcohol and civilization, but we'll we'll see when we get there. <laughs> but uh, anyways, yeah, the, just to, to paint the, the picture for the audience, that's what, what it looks like. So what's up, Travin? Why are you in my apartment? Well, I think uh, I think I probably told you something about you know, wanting to create some kind of cozy environment where we could both talk a little bit more easily and have a more natural conversation and forget that the microphone was in front of us. Mm -hmm. You know the echo effect when you call somebody? Yes. You hear yourself? Yes. It's disorienting. It's awful. And whenever I'm aware that I'm being recorded, uh, it's basically the same thing. Yeah. And I can't think straight, so. Yeah. 
I'm hoping that by doing it in your house, we can, at least I can forget that that's there. Sure. Well, I'll tell you, I have a very similar experience when I'm being interviewed also. So you're not alone in that. And I never thought to explain it in that way of like hearing your voice. But there is like, there is this point when you're being interviewed where it's like, I don't know, I guess you're in fight or flight. So you kind of like have this like meta removal from yourself, kind of like Bo Burnham's inside where you're like watching yourself speak. And then you're like, holy fuck, I'm speaking. <laughs> and then it's just like, so I, I get it. But let me, let me just assure you that you sound great now. And... I have absolute confidence that you're going to be able to speak as you do off camera, off the recording devices or whatever. So appreciate that. I have absolute confidence in you. But how did we get to know one another? Uh, I think we met back in 2018. Mm, that sounds right. My ex-girlfriend Megan and I, we went to, uh, we drove to Austin to see Bon Iver at the Moody Theater. Bon Iver or Bon Iver? <laughs> Which one is it? Uh, I don't know. Um, I say Bon Iver, but uh, a lot of people say Bon Iver. You so, say Bon Iver? Bon Iver, yeah. Bon Iver. Bon Iver. Bon Iver. Bon Iver. Bon Iver. Bon Iver. Okay. And uh, I, the show was on like a Saturday in mid to late January, I think. And anyway, we met up with our mutual friend, Stephen, from Nonservium that weekend and had dinner with him at some Indian restaurant. And then... Afterwards, he invited us to some bar nearby, mm -hmm. and we met up with you and, and Cooper. El Coop? El Coop. Who we interviewed also. <laughs> yeah. uh, I love Cooper's interview. Me too. And anyway, I hadn't, we hadn't met either of you yet. And so initially, uh, Cooper and I, we got into a conversation about Stirner and egoism, which we had both coincidentally, we had recently read. And you chimed into the conversation? You, I think it was you asked whether or not I was familiar, or I was listening to y'all speak about it, and you asked whether or not I was familiar, and I was like, no. I just was like weirdly like, right? Didn't I just like fucking act like I didn't? I was just being drunk and weird. Yeah, it was... In retrospect, it, it seems like an absolute dick weird thing to do. It was... That sounds right. The way you chimed in, it was just in this sort of confusing like dismissive way like you were and like you had distorted <laughs> it was like it, like you had distorted this like really distorted interpretation of Scherner yeah uh, whether or not you had read it like your your interpretation of what it was and it was just like really puzzling uh, <laughs> <laughs> until I realized that you were kidding and then of course you know it was all it was all I'm sorry I'm a weirdo like that I oh no you're not you're not any weirder than any of us <laughs> well I've told you before, my first impression of you was that you were an authentic person, a genuine person, a curious person, and a thoughtful person. And um, It was a very yeah. generous description. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope the, first, the way I came across is not representative of, of who I am, but the way you came across is like clearly <laughs> it, like, uh, consistent. You know, you're still warm and curious and thoughtful. And that's one of the reasons I wanted to have you on. Well, thank you, man. I appreciate that. Yeah. Well, just to give everyone, like, a, an idea of where we're going, I hope to talk about anthropology with you, archaeology, music, maybe mental health stuff. All conversations that we have had off air. It's not often that people's political interests overlap with their professional. I mean, it's, it's almost become a trope, especially on the left. It's like you've got your day job and then you've got activism but yeah. your world overlaps significantly yeah so can you tell everyone what you do for a living and how your profession might overlap with some of your political interests yeah for sure you know i'm an anthropologist of sorts i work as an archaeologist for a cultural heritage management company in texas and basically the shorthand of it is that i dig up old garbage and tell tall tales for a living we look for archaeological sites define their boundaries, determine their integrity and significance, protect them when we can, excavate them when we can't, and ultimately interpret them to construct some kind of narrative to make sense of it all. As for the other part of the question, I would say that it's this, this construction of narrative and storytelling that overlaps with my political interests. So much of the struggle for self-governance or freedom from state violence is about challenging the standard narratives of capitalism, uh, nationalism, and other forms of authoritarianism and offering alternatives in their place. And 
archaeology in its own way, especially more recently, is about challenging the standard narratives of human progress or outdated models of social evolution and other oversimplifications, the origins of inequality or assumptions about human nature. But these counter narratives, or I should say more accurately, like new narratives, are often left to academia. I mean, in CRM, storytelling isn't usually so romantic or revolutionary. And, you know, there's a lot of frustrations and limitations in the sorts of stories we do tell. We're sometimes beholden to certain client confidentialities or, you know, we're not allowed to discuss or work with the general public to protect private interests. Or we're discouraged from speaking publicly about controversial projects we're involved in, again, to protect private interests. And this is uh, unfortunate because these are the ones that are probably the most important to talk about. But even when we aren't silenced, most of the stories we do end up telling are in r reports of great literature that most people will never read or even know exists, uh, other than our clients or the tribes or the state and federal agencies. You can sometimes find public copies of CRM reports if you contact the State Historic Preservation Office. You can also sometimes find them on TDAR, the digital archaeological record and similar repositories online, but even many of these reports are just culture history reports. So what is cultural history? Culture history refers to the construction of regional and temporal culture histories, or simply a, a kind of cultural timeline for, for a particular region, a timeline that's divided into different cultural periods based on the presence or absence of particular artifacts or features, or in some cases, known ethnic groups. In Texas, for example, we talk about the Paleo-Indian period based on the presence of uh, unstemmed dark points used to hunt megafauna from the late Pleistocene. We talk about the Archaic period based on the presence of stemmed dark points and often the presence of burned rock middens and ground stone tools like monos or matates, mortars and pestles that were used for processing plant foods. And we talk about the late prehistoric based on the presence of arrowheads and pottery and in some places shell middens. The bow and arrow haven't been around here for very long, by the way. I realize that a lot of people are surprised to find out that in Texas it's only about 1,500 years old. Same with pottery. Pottery in Texas is only a couple thousand years old. And anyway, this is all just very general. Uh, I mean, Texas is made up of several cultural, ecological regions, which each have their own culture histories. And But anyway, this is essentially culture history. But it's, a, and it's all a necessary first step to produce a sort of who, what, when, and where framework that allows us to see the big picture. But this is a static image. It's not dynamic. It, it doesn't by itself offer explanations about how culture changes over time. It doesn't offer an explanation, for example, as to why people stopped making darts and nautilatals and started making bows and arrows instead. Well, how does culture change over time? Uh, well, to give a little bit of the flavor of the history of archaeological thought in the U.S., Archaeologists started trying to come up with explanations to this question in the 1960s. This was after most of the culture histories had been generally sketched out. They used a variety of approaches like systems theory and cultural ecology to explain the process of culture change. And these approaches were referred to as processualism or processual archaeology. And they generally explain this process as a result of humans interacting with their environments with an emphasis on the, the group. And... Uh, all of these approaches were explicitly positivistic and nomothetic, which is to say that they used research design and scientific method, and they were generally trying to discover laws of human behavior. But uh, a lot of uh, archaeologists were critical of, of this approach. Many were skeptical that processualism was, was actually unbiased and objective, and many argued that the interpretation of the past was dependent on the perspective of the observer, that multiple interpretations of the past were possible. And this critique of processualism brought in alternative theoretical approaches that emphasized the individual instead, that focused on gender and power and exchange. And uh, these approaches borrowed from feminism or Marxism or even more recently, anarchism. And these, these new critical approaches are generally referred to as post-processualism or post-processual archaeology. So... How did you come to embrace anarchism? Uh, Daniel Quinn was the gateway for me. I read Ishmael in college and it changed my life. Quinn taught me the, the value of story and that uh, a culture is essentially a group of people enacting a particular story. And this is a little more to the point than the way that anthropologists sometimes define culture. My professor, Dr. Widmer, 
he defined it as the learn shared pattern integrated symbolic sets of behaviors and behavioral byproducts of a particular group mm. um, and this is a rich description no doubt but it's a bit unwieldy Widmer's definition is a toolbox you keep in the garage you know you can use it to make big beautiful things like cabinets and furniture and Quinn's definition is a multi-tool you can carry around with you you probably don't want to use it to make furniture but it's it's pretty good for all the little things in a pinch before I read Ishmael, I, I believed that reading fiction was a luxury, that the most efficient way to truth and understanding was through nonfiction, and the only real way to know anything was through science. This was a very prickly position to take, but it's, it's what I valued at the time. I don't feel this way anymore, but Quinn taught me that the stories we tell each other and the stories we tell ourselves matter. They make a difference. They make us different. They make us feel differently. They make us act and interact differently. The stories are the operating instructions. We tell stories, but they tell us how to be. They tell us how to behave and how to interact with others. They tell us where we belong in the world, uh, where home is, who our family is, and who our enemies are, you know, who we can marry, who we can have sex with, what we can eat, what we can drink, what we can put in our bodies, what we can put on them. And uh, they're not always true, uh, and they're not always helpful. And they're also not always clear. Sometimes they're invisible. Sometimes they're buried under years of lived experience, and maybe even sometimes we bear them to forget them, but even when they're buried, they're still guiding us, you know, they're the, still in the topsoil affecting the way the plant grows at the surface. And when they're buried, uh, we have to dig them up to notice them or remember them so that we can ultimately dispute them and replace them with better stories, ones that are true and ones that are perhaps actually helpful. And this is how I've also come to embrace archaeology, because this is essentially what we do as archaeologists. And since you mentioned mental health earlier, more recently I've been thinking about how similar this is to CBT, or cognitive behavioral therapy. Mm -hmm. CBT is a kind of synthesis of behaviorism and cognitive therapy. Behaviorism basically says that our responses to our environments shape our behavior, and uh, you know, that behavior can be measured and trained and altered. And cognitive therapy says that our uh, emotional distress is largely caused by our thoughts about an event rather than the event itself, which is very different from psychoanalysis. In psychoanalysis, the view is that basically there's some activating event in your past, some trauma that's causing your emotional disturbances, and that you need to dig up these traumas in order to process them so that you can heal and find peace of mind. And cognitive behavioral therapy says that this isn't necessarily true or even helpful, that your past experiences aren't responsible for your present state of mind, that instead your rational beliefs are, and the goal of cognitive behavioral therapy is to identify those irrational beliefs, to dig them up, to dispute them, and ultimately replace them with rational ones. A lot of this is based on Albert Ellis's rational mode of behavior therapy from the 1950s. That's fascinating. That's pretty cool how you can connect those two fields in that way, and I can see the similarity in how you would be drawn towards those in, a, in that way. So yeah. Didn't you tell me, though, that Clay played a role in, <laughs> in you embracing anarchism finally, right? You, you don't have to go through the whole story if you don't want to, but you told me off air before that you were like a, you're like a contrarian metalhead, essentially, <laughs> who after repeat engagement with Clay Baby Zobelak... Yeah, this is true. ...finally came around to embracing anarchism. Tell, tell us that story briefly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was... It was uh, I did come around to it very gradually. I mean, I met Clay you know, over a decade ago, and we were in college, we were both studying anthropology together. We actually were set up on a sort of date by some mutual friends who told us both for a while that we were best friends, essentially that we, we didn't know it yet, right? Um, and so we finally got together and- <laughs> I didn't know that, that's cool. Yeah, it was, it was really nice. We, we, had a, we had lunch over at the Hobbit Cafe, and then we wandered over to um, Sound Waves, and uh, I think I actually bought For Emma Forever ago. Bony Bear. I think that was the day I bought that CD. Huh. Because I think he recommended it to me. Huh. But uh, anyway, you know, we, we became very close friends very quickly. And, uh, you know, from the beginning, he, he exposed me to a lot of really weird stuff. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and I thought for a long time that a lot of the stuff that uh, he introduced me to was basically dangerous and reckless. And it took a long time for me to open up to enough to like um, really seriously consider the value of a lot of the stuff that he was talking about. 
the, the pivotal moment was when he dropped me off at George Bush International Airport. I was leaving the country for a year of study abroad. I was going to, on my way to Sweden and to Norway. And right before we parted ways, he, he gave me a copy of Ishmael. Okay. And on the inside of the cover said, uh, you know, here you go, you contrarian asshole. <laughs> <laughs> And so it was, it was, it was two gifts. It was the one, the gift of the critique that mm -hmm. I really appreciated. And I really took it to heart. I, I knew, I knew that he meant it and that I, I, I needed to listen to that. And, um, and that alone really changed me. I felt like that made me really see myself in a different way and really try to just be more open-minded to other people, be more, um, you know, vulnerable and curious about others. And then, the, of course, the book itself, and I started reading it in the airport. And at the time, I hadn't read a piece of fiction in years. I mean, I'd read tons of nonfiction. Yeah. Um, but this was the first fiction I'd read in years. And I re finished that book maybe in three days. And wow. then I had picked up Story of B and read that in a couple of days, mm -hmm. My Ishmael in a couple of days. Yeah. And by the, it was within almost a week that suddenly I just felt like my world was turned upside down. Wow. Yeah. It's wild how quickly those things can change. <laughs> So before we get into some of the more specific questions I have, I want to continue to like paint a picture of, of who you are. And it's kind of difficult to pin you down specifically and what box you might, what anarchist box you might fit in. A lot of hyphenated anarchists aren't usually as eclectic as you. Hmm. You seem to draw from a wide range of interests and influences. For example, you've told me that one book that was important to you when you were first learning about anarchism was Gary Chartier's Stateless Legal Order. Or uh, Anarchy and Legal Order. Anarchy and Legal Order. And also, I mean, we have a stack of David Graeber's books in front of us that you've told me you've read twice all the way through and there's one two three four five six seven of his books right here so how do we fit that together i mean the influences are vast daniel quinn you've mentioned i know derek jensen is one ursula kayla gwynn james c scott i mean there's a lot of a lot of folks right so how is it that you're able to pull from so many different types of thinkers and tendency and come to like a sort of coherent political position that we can call Travid Halton. Hmm, I don't know. I don't think of myself as especially open-minded about any of this. I mean, uh, on, on the one hand, I enjoy reading for its own sake. Le Guin said that reading was a form of communion with another mind. Hmm. And I've enjoyed communing with so many minds among, you know, the living and the dead. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and then on the other hand, I'm used to doing literature reviews for reports mm -hmm. to know about previously recorded sites and surveys that are relevant to our project and our scope of work. And in that sense, uh, I pull from so many sources, I guess, because they all, they're all relevant. And, you know, I've read a lot over the past few years, but I'm, I'm just beginning to synthesize all this stuff in a, in a way that's useful and coherent. You know, good research is about making connections between points. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so many of the ideas I've been exposed to are, for me, still just so many stars in the night sky, basically. I'm still trying to sketch out the constellations. I'm not certain I personally have anything novel to contribute to the conversation yet. And, uh, you know, also anarchism is a, it's a community project with as many voices that, as make up each community. And so, you know, everybody has different perspectives and passions and insights and desires. And uh, so anarchism is necessarily made up of, you know, a thousand voices. How could it be otherwise? You know, to borrow from the, a line from the musician Slow Meadow, there are no passengers on this spaceship. We are all crew. Damn. So what box? I mean, if, if we had to slap a label on, on Travid, do we call you? We don't quite call you a market anarchist. We don't quite call you simply a democratic confederalist. What, what do we call Travid's version of anarchism? Uh... <laughs> We have fun with this sort of thing in Houston among the Yegsa crew sometimes. Who's the Yegsa crew? Explain that real quick. Uh, Clay's, Clay's explained it briefly in his episode, but just to... Yeah, yeah. Yegsa is, uh, I think it's an Atacapan word or Akokisan word for other. 
it's what the indigenous, a lot of them, the upper Texas coast use to refer to foreigners. Mm-hmm. And there's a group of us who basically take this seriously that, you know, we recognize that we are, that we are the beneficiaries of colonization, but we also, we recognize that there were people here before us and, and that this is a real place yeah. that has both a cultural and natural, has both cultural and natural histories and a particular place and, and try to remember that. Mm-hmm. I get it. I get it. Yeah. That makes sense. Keep going. What, what's the label? How do we label you? Right, right, yeah. So uh, I jokingly describe myself as a Le Guinian Sternerite. Nice. I've heard Scott Crow talk about anarchism in terms of freedom from and freedom to. Okay. Uh, and I feel like this silly label captures and, and, and reflects that. That Sterner, in, in his way, represents the freedom from side of anarchism. The hatchet. <laughs> yeah, That's what Clay called it. I like that. While Le Guin represents the freedom to side of anarchism. And, you know, maybe, maybe another way to say it would be to call myself a utopian egoist. Because, you know, that's basically what I'm talking about. Egoism and utopianism. To live one's life in full participation of the actual interesting at the exclusion of the un- uninteresting. And to do that in the here and now. Mm-hmm. But also to imagine that other worlds and ways of being are possible. Mm-hmm and to make a concerted collaborative effort to create those worlds and to bring them into coexistence. So I like to think of egoism as a kind of slash and burn horticulture of ideology. Hmm. You know, you can use it to clear out an overgrown tract of nasty thorn scrub or secondary growth or invasives that probably shouldn't be there anyway. Hmm. Uh, and, and you can use utopianism to plant a sustainable community garden to grow in its place. We could easily spend a lot of time on utopia, the topic of utopia <laughs> itself. I mean, how long have, have you and I talked about that just earlier today, about the problems with utopia and no place versus the good place and how like utopia drives us towards topias, blah, blah, blah. Let's, let's just shelf that for now because I feel like that would, that would be a great like podcast in and of itself. I want to say one more thing about this, though. I think it's that to come back to Scott Crow. I think it's really important what he says about the freedom from and freedom to, and that it's really important to remember both sides. If anarchism becomes too focused on what it opposes, whether you know it's the state or capitalism or patriarchy or something like this, that it can slip into some kind of self-sacrificing contrarianism that basically produces more suffering. But at the same time, if it becomes too fixated on what it's for, it can become a kind of gross, self-serving lifestyleism that doesn't really bother to take care of other people and those suffering the worst forms of actual like yeah, structural violence. You're going to have to unpack that. You're saying if there's too much of a focus on what you want freedom for, yeah, it becomes tyrannical? What are, what are you saying? It, it can turn into a kind of lifestyleism, basically. My concern with this is that I think that people who are f- emphasizing their own particular freedom to projects, that they might not be attending to playing any part in the defensive side of anarchism and liberatory politics, that they're not willing to take any actual risks of putting their livelihoods or their bodies on the line. And that this is a kind of privileged thing to do to begin with. And you need both. I mean, we need to have people who are creative and and imaginative and, and create new ways of, of organizing and ways of exchange and, and, and relating to one another. And we also need people who are willing to take to the streets and people who are willing to form like basically like neighborhood popular militias and things like this and create dual power structures. You need both of these things. Mm-hmm. I think I get it. We just got some texts from, uh, speaking of Yegso, we just got a couple of texts from them in, the, what are they saying? in one, of our, one of our group chats. They're like... <laughs> Uh, I sent up a picture of you when you were playing guitar, and they're just. <laughs> Akanto was like, "This is an event," and yeah, it's. Yeah, they're. Uh, I think they're excited that we're doing this. Um, so, have have we touched on sort of what drew you towards anthropology, uh, or ecology in general yet? No, yeah, I don't think we really have talked about that. 
So what do you think draws you towards an interest in anthropology or ecology? I, uh, I think what appeals to me most about both of these disciplines is that they're both profoundly humanizing and unalienating, or at least they can be. I came into anthropology in my first or second year of college. I went to school initially to study linguistics and took an introduction to anthropology as a humanities credit. In North America, anthropology is a discipline. It's divided into four fields, um, and linguistics is one of them. The others are archaeology, physical anthropology, and culture anthropology. Mm-hmm. And since I was planning to go to graduate school anyway, I figured it, I might as well generalize first and specialize later. And after I got my associate's degree, I transferred to university and spent the next couple of years focusing exclusively on anthropology. And when I switched over initially, it was, it was mostly just a practical decision. You know, get the BS in anthropology and go to grad school and uh, to go back to work on linguistics. And uh, at the time and for years, I'd been really interested in the relationship between the mind and language, how our thoughts and feelings are so wrapped up in our words. And this initial interest was largely a result of basically jerry-rigging my own kind of rational, emotional, uh, behavioral therapy that got me through my first few OCD spikes in my late Mm -hmm. teens and early 20s. Mm -hmm. And I I had struggled for a long time with episodes of dissociation. And uh, if you've never experienced it, it can be deeply disturbing and and profoundly alienating. Mm -hmm. You know, you feel disconnected from yourself and from what's going on around you. You lose your sense of identity and and feel like a stranger in your own body. But your work in language helped you get back to... Yeah. Yeah, it did. (laughs) Anthropology is often framed in terms of humanizing others, but it can also be a way to humanize the self. And, you know, for me personally, anthropology rehumanized me. When I came into anthropology, it was like somebody finally gave me the operating instructions. But that, you know, that was how I largely came, came into anthropology. My relationship to it now is a little different. I see it now more as a kind of myth buster and as a kind of world builder. So both the utopian and egoist side. Yeah, basically. Yeah. I didn't think about it like that, but yeah. <laughs> That's cool. Um, you know, and every society has its myths. I mean, including our own. But uh, they're not always true and they're not always helpful. And archaeology and anthropology together are are pretty good at uprooting some of these myths. Yeah, that's interesting. I feel like Clay would push back on the true and helpful part. And that was one thing that got me thinking one time he was like, and I hope I'm not exposing him too much, but one time he was like, I kind of don't give a shit about what's true. He's like, (laughs) he's like, he's like, this like is useful to me. And I think we're talking about some sort of myth. Or something like that. Yeah. I thought that was beautiful, though. It's like, that can be dangerous. It's a weapon to, to you know, you have to, you have to be mindful of using, why, like, you know, with caution. Right. But it's also, if, you've, if you can let go of, like, a, kind of a scientism, I guess, you know, you can... I don't know if that, that, that contradicts what you're saying at all. I don't think so. No, I mean, I think I mentioned it earlier, but, you know, the largely... The reaction to the, uh, the processual archaeology that came out of the 1960s that was explicitly positivistic, that was mm-hmm. explicitly based on scientific method. Mm-hmm. The reaction to that was more interested in a humanistic approach mm-hmm. to the past, which includes uh, you know, these more anarchist archaeological approaches that emphasize the individual. And they're not using positivistic means to, to go about this necessarily. I mean, ethnography, for example, is not a science. It's a, it's, it's a rich description of a community and, and the ways that they behave and interact with each other. And it, and it itself it accounts for 2% of what's really going on. Mm-hmm. And so in that sense, it's not really reproducible. So it's not really science. But it's still as if ethnographic descriptions are still useful. Um, mm-hmm. They give us windows into other societies and how they live. And archaeology now is, has benefited from this post-processual approach to the mm-hmm. past. Um, so what you've said is not, it's not a contradiction. Yeah. Well, that makes me think of one criticism of, of archaeology. And that is that it grows out of colonialism and race science. Yeah. All cards on the table, I'm basically ignorant compared to you when it comes to archaeology and anthropology. 
So is it, what, is there any truth to that claim? Now, how do you deal with that? Uh, you know, I think archaeology r- really comes mostly out of nationalism and uh, the building of nation states. Benedict Anderson pointed out that the census, the map, and the museum are crucial projects for nation building. Hmm. That, you know, the first step of building a nation is, is drawing the boundaries. Right? Mm-hmm. But the boundaries themselves are meaningless without content. Right. You know, this is the same for, for words. Or, you know, words are, uh, are meaningless until you fill them up with content or meaning. Mm-hmm. <laughs> a nation state is, is meaningless until you, you fill up the boundaries with, with meaningful content. Right. Um, and so uh, after you've <laughs> defined the boundaries of a nation state, you map out the natural and cultural resources within its domain. You know, you map out the flora and fauna, the rivers and aquifers, the rocks and minerals, the oil, gas, and coal, you know. I mean, these nation states are, 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 are based on intense, uh, intensive resource extraction, so it makes sense that they would do this, right? But, mm-hmm. but also, you map out the cultural resources as well, the human communities and populations that become the citizens and subjects of these nation states. And you take a head count of, you know, all the people within these boundaries and, and the languages that they speak and the religions that they practice. And then you, you create a museum to um, basically, <laughs> which is basically like a, a highly curated hubristic space where artifacts from the past are presented as kinds of fetishes mm-hmm. of, of national and state power. That, mm-hmm. that project themselves back into the past immemorial mm-hmm. and where the new citizens and subjects can come to these spaces and see these objects firsthand and take part in this f- like false teleological narrative mm-hmm. that the things that they're looking at are productions of their ancestors who are all building up this national project mm-hmm. that, that they were... Um, <laughs> they didn't all know it, mm-hmm. uh, but uh, at the time, but you know, they were French or German or English, but they were, you know, for centuries or millennia leading up to the foundation of the nation state, that they were all in spirit, <laughs> in some sense, German or French or English, but they just didn't yet have the map or the census or the museum to tell them. Mm-hmm they were right. right and this is particularly true for for places where nation building took place in situ like in, in in europe for example rather than nation building that took place in response to flight from some form of imperialism like in the united states mm-hmm. right like the people who came here to the united states the europeans when they started doing archaeology they didn't think that the Native American artifacts and features and archaeological sites were, you know, the cultural heritage of these Europeans. But, but people in Europe, for example, do largely see these things in these terms. And so these objects are essentially fetishes that legitimize sovereignty, that archaeology is done, in a sense, to produce jingoistic self-portraitures. Mm-hmm. Of, of nations. So all, the, all that to demonstrate that just as you can use archaeology as counter narratives to power, to prevailing narratives, those prevailing narratives also came from, or were assisted in some way by archaeology. They were assisted by museums, they're assisted by yes. maps right. and everything. So you started the conversation off with, with explaining how this weapon, archaeology, can be used to to combat prevailing narratives. It seems to me that you just explained how the prevailing narratives came to be as we know them, as prevalent as they are because of archaeology. <laughs> archaeology at least assisted in it. Absolutely. So it's amoral. It doesn't lead you to liberation necessarily. <laughs> right. Yeah, no, this is, uh, this is true. The spirit of archaeology 100 years ago is very different than the spirit of archaeology today. And that's a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Why are so many archaeologists also anarchists? Uh, you know, I don't know that there are 
that many. I mean, I've heard it said in a, in other conversations that it's the case. You wouldn't say that with like science in general, right? With a lot of other studies in general, but you know, I've from personal experience, I've been doing archaeology for almost a decade now, and I know one other archaeologist who happens to be a coworker of mine who explicitly identifies as an anarchist. Mm -hmm. But he's the only person that comes to mind. There are a lot of archaeologists that I've talked to about anarchism who have, you know, willingly engaged with me on this and they we've had genuinely pleasant and insightful discussions about it. You know, and I can't say the same for a lot of people who identify as like liberal, progressive or conservative, right? I have, tend to have a lot of hostile interactions with people who have these kind of political leanings. Mm -hmm. um, but I think for archaeologists, what at least makes them open-minded, I've never met an archaeologist who is unwilling to engage in the conversations about anarchism. And so that in itself is meaningful. But I don't know how many of them would call themselves anarchists. Mm -hmm. But with that said, I would say that probably what makes them at the very least comfortable talking about anarchism is that <laughs> they are on a regular basis, coming into contact with the remains of so many cultures that were essentially, uh, you know, anarchist societies. And this is similar to anthropologists. Anthropologists are keenly aware that anarchism is at least a, a real human possibility because they've investigated, you know, so many of them have, have investigated actually existing stateless societies. Mm -hmm. And so many of them have in, investigated actually existing non-market economies. Mm -hmm. um, so they know what these things look like. They know they exist and they, they, they exist and they know that they work. They're not impossible, <laughs> that they're not pipe dreams. So yeah, it's the same with archaeologists. And I would say maybe another reason is because archaeologists spend a lot of their time on the road. I mean, a lot, of, a lot of us live much of the year in hotels, and <laughs> this is a kind of, uh, this is a kind of, you know, a version of like, you know, seasonal mobility that is on some level similar to like, you know, the movement of, of hunter-gatherer societies. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a lot of us spend much of our time in the woods or in the mountains or in, in the, the wilds more generally outside the purview of the state and and so i think it's easier for a lot of us to just uh comfortably engage with this yeah yeah so going back to the idea that that anthropology and archaeology is a tool that can be used to create counter narratives to power or to create narratives that inform power archaeological research as we know it to some degree depends on large institutional funding. Is that proof that the study is not actually a threat to power? Hmm. Well, I would say one that regardless of the funding, the stories that we tell are published either way, you know, like, and those, the, those stories are still chipping away at the standard, you know, so many different, you know, standard narratives, right? But also at the same time, archeology, span really does have a lot of counterpower potential to shut down entire projects. I've been on projects where we were surveying for weeks or months and um, suddenly um, it became basically impractical for the client to continue the work because of the number of sites or the kinds of sites we were, we were finding. Huh. And, uh, you know, I mean, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars and the complete shutdown of massive projects. So archaeology can be a real adversary against, you know, the bulldozer of capital to at least slow things down long enough to be able to see what could be lost or to stop development entirely to protect uh, what's valuable. That's fascinating. So you, you mentioned earlier how anthropology can act as kind of a myth buster of sorts. What are some examples of some of these myths? You know, for one, that uh, democracy was invented in the West. <laughs> that uh, the reality is that democracy is, is as old as human history. Nobody invented it. It doesn't emerge from any particular intellectual or cultural tradition. And it's practiced basically wherever and whenever a large group of people come together to make collective decisions. 
whenever and wherever these same group of people believe that anybody taking part should have equal say. It, it tends to get overlooked by political scientists, usually because most actually democratic societies don't vote. But voting and democracy historically very rarely occur together. And where they do occur together is usually in military societies, where everyone taking part is armed and trained in the use of weapons, or in societies that frequently engage in, in public spectacles of competition, like ancient Greece. So, you know, I think that this, this myth is important to dispute because it, it shows that voting is not the norm. And it challenges the, basically the ignorant idea that voting is the only way that large groups of people can make decisions together. Um, it's just not true. Quick side note, it would be interesting, just as there is a book sitting on the table over there called Marcus Not Capitalism, what if there's a book called Democracy Not Voting? I don't even stand democracy, but I would read the fuck out of that. Like... <laughs> I think it's a good title. They would be so fascinating. Yeah. Because I don't, I don't see those things as separate. Right. But it's really fascinating to think that yeah. that, that it could be that way. Right. I mean, that's how our culture talks about it. That's right. how uh, it's been framed. That's the way that the standard narrative has co-opted the term democracy is to, to mean, to refer to a group of people who make decisions by way of voting. And then if, you, if you're not voting, you're not actually democratic. If, if your society doesn't use voting to make decisions, that they're, that they're not a democracy, and that's just not true. Hmm. Most actual democratic societies make decisions through some form of consensus. That's interesting. Some people would separate consensus from democracy. Yeah. But that's, that's kind of splitting hairs, maybe. Interesting. But, you know, this is all related to another myth that population size that predetermines the ways people will organize politically, that small populations will naturally be more egalitarian and large populations will naturally be more hierarchical. And actually, when you look at the ethnographic record, there's a lot of variety here. Most people are aware that there are hunter-gatherer societies that are essentially egalitarian. But there are also hunter-gatherer societies that have nobles and slaves. Mm -hmm. And most people are aware that, you know, a lot of agricultural and pastoral societies are hierarchical. But there are also agricultural and pastoral societies that are fiercely egalitarian. Mm -hmm. Right? Which points to another myth. That, that humans start out in simple egalitarian band societies and, and evolve into increasingly more complex hierarchical forms over time, from bands to tribes to chiefdoms to states, that all societies are evolving in this unilinear direction and, and all non-state societies just haven't gotten there yet, mm -hmm. but they're trying. Yeah. You know, but on the contrary, what you actually see is that uh, many societies are constantly reforming. Uh, societies are, are skipping back and forth all the time between what we imagine is, as uh, evolutionary stages. And also the idea that band societies are simple is itself problematic. Lack complexity. Yeah, that they lack complexity. This way of describing band societies is, is problematic. You know, the myriad of ways these kinds of societies use counterpower to limit or prevent the emergence of rank or hierarchies within their societies is anything but simple. And this points not to another myth, necessarily, but to the problem of, uh, of even trying to talk about ethnic groups based on their subsistence or how they go about getting food. You know, like referring to, <laughs> referring to foragers as hunter-gatherers is about as useful as referring to people who buy their food as grocery shoppers. Hmm. You know, calling you a grocery shopper essentializes you in a way that's obviously absurd. Right. You know, what does it tell... Yeah. How about you to call you a grocery yeah. shopper? Yeah, yeah. But this label might give you a sense of, of understanding that's false and, mm -hmm. and extraordinarily limited. So, you know, referring to hunter-gatherers is, you know, using these kinds of labels is, is problematic in and of itself mm -hmm. because there's tremendous diversity among these groups. So th this is not to say that these kinds of labels are useless, but it's to point out that uh, their use is limited. And it, you know, it's a reminder that we need to be careful to avoid essentializing and oversimplifying sure. complex identities. That sounds horrible to thousands of years from now, they look back at our society and refer to us as <laughs> the grocery shoppers, shoppers of history. Right. They didn't even know we had podcasts. <laughs> uh, you know, and one other myth that I want to bring up is that money was invented to make barter easier. 
actually money was invented to pay soldiers. Barter exists only among groups of people who are already used to using money but can't get their hands on any. And I think this is particularly important maybe for market anarchists to consider. Because historically, markets uh, were created by governments as side effects of military operations. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you were somehow able to do away with the state, it's not quite clear whether money and markets would really even stick around. That our commercial economy might morph into a kind of human economy, where things like gold and cash and Bitcoin might start to be used in ways like primitive monies, like Iroquois wampum or raffia cloth or uh, Solomon Island feathers. Like disconnecting currency from commercialism? Yeah. You know, and, and, um, and human economies, this might be contrary to common sense in, in the way we think about using money, but uh, primitive money isn't used to buy goods or services at all. It's, it's really only used to create and maintain or, or, or alter relationships. Or, or to say it differently, uh, primitive money was not used to pay uh, debts of any kind. It was used to uh, recognize the existence of debts that could never be paid. You know, two examples to illustrate this are, are marriage and death. In the case of marriage, a bride wealth is given to a wife's family. And the bride wealth could be, you know, brass rods or whale's teeth or whatever the local social currency is. And this isn't to purchase the woman from her family. In such a society, the only appropriate payment for the gift of a woman is another woman. The bride wealth, instead, it's given as a physical token of an outstanding debt. And in the case of death, uh, particularly in the case of murder, a blood wealth is paid to the family of the deceased. Mm-hmm. Um, and similarly, the blood wealth could be, you know, whale's teeth or brass rods or whatever the social currency is. Um, but this in, in no way is offered as compensation for the loss of a loved one. The only compensation in, in this kind of society could be another life and not a life taken as in some kind of revenge killing, but uh, a life given. This is a strange example, but in, in some cases, it might be a child who would be recognized by the community in some way taking the place of the victim or becoming the victim's son or daughter. You know, the blood wealth is given as a physical token of the outstanding debt. So relatedly, some radicals are weary of the ivory tower of academics having an oversized role in radical politics. Beyond what you've already explained about challenging prevailing narratives, why should we care about the works of anthropologists or ecologists and the struggle for emancipation. Uh, I think that's a pretty healthy position to take. Marxism was the only great social movement that was invented by a PhD, and I mean, look at the mess that Uncle Carl made. I think anthropologists in particular are valuable resources because they have such a broad view shed on of human variation. I mean, um, anthropologists are, are keenly aware of the range of human possibilities. Most actually existing self-governing communities in the world have been investigated by anthropologists, and most actually existing non-market economies have been ex- investigated by anthropologists. And so if you want to know what possible uh, alternatives to state capitalism might look like, ethnography has a lot to offer. And as Graeber says, you know, we can turn to ethnography not as prescriptions, uh, but as contributions, as possibilities, as gifts. Cool. So I'm realizing now that we didn't get an opportunity to explore that much on ecology And um, if you don't mind, I'd like to briefly return to that, if possible. Yeah, for sure. So you said earlier that ecology was unalienating. What do you mean by that? Well, basically, ecology reconnects you to your environment. And not just the environment in some general abstract sense of nature or the outdoors, um, but the actual particular environment in which you live. You know, there's no more intimacy in knowing about the environment in general than there is knowing about humans in general. Um, when you go to a party where you don't know anybody, you might as well be alone, right? I mean, real intimacy comes from knowing particular people. And in the same way, real intimacy with the environment comes from knowing a particular environment. Most of us know how to create intimacy with people, but some of us have to relearn how to create intimacy with our environments. And in order to have intimacy, you have to bring curiosity and vulnerability to the relationship. And this is as true for people as it is for the environment. And, and humans as animals need to have intimate relationships with their environments. Urbanism and suburbanism tend to promote these very human-centered perspectives and experiences that exclude much of the rest of the world around them. In my own experience, this tends to create a desperate sense of loneliness and isolation. 
you know, you're surrounded by manicured lawns and non-native exotic plants and detention ponds and channelized drainages and, you know, most of the animals you see are domesticated dogs and cats. And cats, particularly feral ones, are a menace to wildlife, by the way. And anyway, these are all highly artificial environments and they're areas of drastically reduced biodiversity. And basically the ecology of the suburbs are terribly impoverished. Often the only traces of the original ecologies of these places are the street signs, which are essentially memorial markers of the dead that have been leveled by the bulldozers of capital. Damn. That was poetic. <laughs> leveled by the bulldozers of capital. Damn. I mean, haven't you ever been in a neighborhood where you see the, the street signs and they're, you know, called like Yopon or yeah. Holly Street or yeah. whatever? It's like an homage to what it destroyed. Right. And you, there's not a Yopon or Holly in sight. Yeah. Yeah, that's kind of it's sad to think about. <laughs> So ecology it, uh, reconnects us to the environment, and, uh, and that's important because that connection carries with it responsibility. When you don't have a relationship to another person, you don't have a responsibility to them. And likewise, when you don't have a relationship to, to a particular environment, you have no responsibility to it. And so ecology teaches us what our responsibilities are and how to manage them. If I had to summarize it all, I would say this, that anthropology teaches us that there's no one right way to live. Uh, ecology warns us that we can't continue to live this way. And together, anthropology and ecology offer us ways we can live differently. That's a beautiful summary, Travid. To this point, we've talked a lot about uh, anthropology, ecology, archaeology. We've touched on all these things to, to a pretty good extent. Who are some archaeologists and ecologists that most inform your political thinking? I haven't read a lot of ecologists, per se. Um, I studied ecology in college, and I regularly incorporate several references for natural history when writing background research in our reports. I do own several field guides for plant and animal identifications in Texas, and I do own a copy of the Texas Master Naturalist Handbook. But uh, anyway, I, I can't think of any particular ecologists who uh, inform my political thinking. If I had to point to somebody, I would probably say Derek Jensen, but Jensen isn't an ecologist. He's a, a, like an eco-philosopher or you know, and a radical environmentalist. Have you read any of his work? No, I haven't. It'll change you. Okay. <laughs> I recommend Endgame Volumes 1 and 2. He uses a sort of clockwork orange style aversion therapy. It's a pacifism in these books. Hmm. Basically, you know, he shows page after page how civilization has been decapitating mountains and vacuuming oceans and choking rivers and burning down forests. And, you know, he makes an urgent case for direct action against all these forms of human domination and exploitation of the environment. And in the end, he, he makes a pretty compelling argument for violence as a moral responsibility. Damn. A far less controversial influence for me is Roy Betacek. Uh, he was a Texas naturalist from the late 19th century who wrote passionately about Texas ecology and folklore. And he also expressed a deep concern for the loss of Texas's natural heritage. I don't believe he ever came close to Jensen's convictions, but he did reject the objective scientism of his time, which is still present in our own. Basically that this attitude or assumption that you can't be a good scientist or naturalist if you are passionate about what you study and what you care about. As for anthropologists, at the top of the list is obviously David Graeber for me. Mm -hmm. And through his work, I've, I've been exposed to several others, particularly Marcel Mauss and Pierre Clostre. I've heard some people say Pierre Clostres. I've only ever read his name <laughs> prior to hearing this pronunciation, so I'm used to saying Pierre Clostre. But also uh, James C. Scott. Of course. Uh, <laughs> you know, we could spend an entire hour taking each of these people one by one and talking about their work. But since we don't have time for that, I can maybe only give a, a bit of a taste. But, you know, David Graeber himself wrote tons of content. You could dedicate an entire season of non just discussing his works uh, alone. That's true. Marcel Mauss is really important to me because he was the first anthropologist to critique the myth of barter. Before him, it was universally assumed that economies without money or markets operated through barter, that they were all trying to engage in market behavior that they were all trying to acquire goods and services at the least cost to themselves and to get rich if possible, but that they hadn't come up with a sophisticated way of doing it yet. And Mauss demonstrated that this is all basically nonsense, that non-market economies were actually gift economies, that they weren't based on calculation, but on like, you know, the very refusal to calculate 
they consciously and explicitly rejected the logics of market economics. To them, the idea that the point of an economic transaction would be to seek the greatest profit would be deeply offensive, uh, mm-hmm. unless the person you were dealing with was maybe you know somebody you hated or your enemy. And then uh, Pierre Clastre was equally important because he was the first anthropologist to really do damage to the myth of social evolution. The idea that humans evolved socially from simple hunter-gatherer societies to more sophisticated state forms. And even more to the point that those who hadn't achieved statehood just hadn't figured out uh, the art of statecraft. And this is as stupid, by the way, as the assumption that hunter-gatherers weren't planting gardens or fields because they just hadn't learned that by putting seeds in the ground they could start growing their own food instead of wandering across the earth on the edge of starvation. There's about a 4,000 year lag between the time humans first started experimenting with domestication of plants and animals and when they became primarily reliant on them. Um, So it's a little hard to make the case that they were very eager to give up foraging for farming. And this, you know, this is all from James E. Scott uh, Mm -hmm. more recently. But uh, anyway, back to Clustre, his main critique was that so-called simple hunter-gatherers weren't aware of what basic forms of state power might be like. They weren't aware of what it would mean to allow some people to give up everybody else orders. That they weren't aware of what it would mean if these orders couldn't be questioned. Or what it would all mean if this was all backed up by the threat of force. His point was that it was their very awareness of what it would all mean that made them determined to prevent such forms of power from ever emerging in the first place. And then there's James C. Scott and David Graeber who have both built a lot of new work on these foundations. I'm less familiar with Scott, but his critique of the standard narrative is particularly important. And this is from his most recent book, Against the Grain, where he essentially rewrites the timeline of prehistory. Well, not he himself, but it's an updated timeline based on the most recent archaeological evidence. And it challenges some of the basic popular assumptions about domestication, like I mentioned earlier, and uh, about how domestication itself isn't a simple process that began with some unusually insightful person who decided to put seeds in the ground. And it's also about when we started occupying permanent settlements and when we started building cities and states. For example, the earliest evidence for sedentism is from about 14,000 years ago, whereas the earliest evidence for walled territorial states is from about 5,000 years ago. There's a significant time lag between the time that humans started settling down and the time that they started building defensive territorial city-states. We're going to have to eliminate a lot of the questions that I had prepared for you. When I don't get to all the questions that I I have for my guests, it's it's usually a sign that the conversation is going really well. And I think that's I think that's definitely the case here. I think that a lot of what you've said is is truly fascinating. So I want to just like briefly dip our toes in the water of, of, of some mental health stuff. So you said earlier that anthropology challenges narratives about society and that CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, does a similar thing with the individual. A lot has been written on mental health in anarchist spaces. And there's one particular perspective that I find challenging, and that's the idea that instead of molding the individual to an unhealthy culture or economy, it's that we should embrace madness and spark a million insurrections against the medical gaze. What do you think about that? I would say it's, you know, it's important to, first of all, destigmatize mental illness. So many of us are, are suffering from so many different forms of mental illness, uh, and I think that can largely be attributed to the you know, social environment, the social, political, economic reality that we're all living through. But as far as embracing madness, it's a little harder for me to uh, agree with that. And I, I will at least speak for myself on this matter. You know, when you're sick, when you feel ill, it's, it's difficult to think about anything other than your own suffering. And when you are suffering, what you want more than anything is peace of mind. And it can be really easy to turn to you know, all sorts of distraction and escape um, because you just want an exit. Real madness is a storm of isolation and self-destruction. You, know, you can easily drown in it. I once heard Alan Watts say that in order to come to your senses, you have to first go out of your mind. And you can do that either voluntarily through recreational drug use or involuntarily through mental illness. In the first case, you take some kind of drug or illicit substance that launches you into outer space. You know, it it alters your perception and opens your mind. And when the drug wears off, you come back down to Earth with a broader understanding or appreciation of yourself and the cosmos surrounding you. And in the second case, some trauma or triggering event or chemical imbalance or whatever causes the floor to basically open up from under your feet. 
and you fall deeply into an abyss and you either get gobbled up by the void or you find some way to climb back out of it. But the only way out is through. I mean, uh, you don't get to wait it out. Darkness doesn't wear off. Mm -hmm. You know, if you do make it back to the surface, it, it won't be you standing under the open sky. Uh, you know, Gandalf the Grey fell into the mines of Moria, but Gandalf the White makes it back to Middle Earth. <laughs> <laughs> um, and also, uh, the, the means are the ends. If the ultimate prize of self-governance is a life of less alienation, of human flourishing, then uh, we need to unalienate people now and help them flourish now. You know, under capitalism, many of us are alienated from our work and the products of our labor. Many of us are alienated from our environments and the communities in which we live. And many of us are also alienated from ourselves. You know, in psychiatry, self-alienation is called dissociation. Yeah. And it's hard to connect with others in your environment when you don't even feel connected to yourself. If we want to build a healthy society, we need to cultivate healthy relationships in our communities now. Encouraging people who are suffering from mental illness to run amok with their minds on fire as if there were a million lit matches ready to burn down the fences and close them, to me, is unconscionable. It reminds me of a conversation I once had with a Maoist who told me that the homeless were potentially the most revolutionary element in society. He suggested that since they really had nothing to lose other than their cardboard boxes, that they might as well fight the good fight. That they should be radicalized and armed and led to storm the city hall like the Bastille. It didn't seem to occur to him that they might also lose their lives. Hmm. Nothing left to lose but their boxes. I mean, desperation promotes that sort of thing or kind of makes that sort of thing more inevitable. I guess it's one thing to point out that that's just simply like a material fact usually. And it's another thing to say that people should do that. It can be particularly dangerous when you're telling someone who's in a different position than you that they should be doing that since you have nothing to lose, but they have everything to, and you know, potentially their lives. I think what you said is also interesting and important because yeah, like embracing madness and launching a million insurrections against the medical gaze sounds romantic in one hand. I think it downplays the hell that overwhelming actual real mental illness has on people and like the role it plays and all sorts of problems. So yeah, like destigmatize, don't romanticize. Right. Self-expression has always been important to me, and I feel that it has contributed towards positive mental health. And that's something that you and I share, is, a, is an interest in music. And we interviewed someone named uh, Maddie. I think it was last year. He goes by Reverend Banjo on Twitter. And in the middle of, or about maybe two-thirds of the way through the conversation, we took a break to get a beer and pour ourselves a glass of wine stuff like that and we played one of his songs that he recorded would you be interested since you have your guitar right here would you be down to give the audience a taste of some of your music yeah for sure i'd be delighted take a brief break play your song and then we can sort of come back circle back around to the lightning round and then the conversation yeah listener questions yeah cool well what are you gonna play um let's see um i'm actually in the middle of recording an album right now called Obsessions, and uh, I'll play a song from that album. The song is called Rewild. <clears throat> Let off 
the collar that chokes you and keeps you still. Don't worry or regret, there's still time Burn the fire that glows and threatens your field Let come the seasons that give and take Let in the flood that you've been holding back You're human, you were never made to live like this Don't worry or regret, there's still time Give it up now, let it go The world is all around you, waiting to be found so travel light, take what you need And leave the rest behind you It'll weigh you down But keep them close, the ones you love They'll be there to guide you When you lose your way And don't forget you'll soon be gone Your losses will remind you Never here to stay Beautiful. Beautiful. Thank you. We got through an entire take without noises, too, basically. <laughs> yeah. The first time you played that, I think I shed a tear. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I love that song. Thanks for thanks for playing that. I, pr I really appreciate you being vulnerable enough to, to want to do that. Yeah. It was beautiful. Thanks for uh, um, letting me share it. Yeah. Sure. Absolutely. I won't, I won't ask you the annoying question of what the song is about. <laughs> I think it speaks for itself. Thank you. That usually just takes the, the piss out of it. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully we can, you know, maybe even put another one of your songs in here in this episode, too, if you're okay with that. Yeah, I think I'm okay with that. Yeah. Considering you have an album that you're writing right now, it might be cool to just give the audience a preview. For it you know yeah for sure all right so we might as well just skip to the lightning round and go to the some of the listener questions and then the end of our conversation um I'm, i regret not being able to ask you some of the things that we had but like like i said that's that's a sign of a good conversation so, <laughs> i'll take your word for it yeah yeah all right so towards the end of these interviews i like to do a lightning round where i list a series of people or ideas and have my guests respond to each item in one minute or less. Are you down? I'm down. All right, cool. So the first one is Ursula K. Le Guin. Uh, I love Ursula K. Le Guin. Her fiction and nonfiction have both profoundly enriched my life. Uh, I read her complete Hainish cycle a few years ago. Obviously, The Dispossessed is treasured by many anarchists, including myself. 
But uh, my favorite story is probably the telling. It's about a linguist who travels to another planet. Uh, I think it's called Akka, to document an unknown Hainish language. And uh, by the time she arrives, the political environment of that planet has changed quite a bit since she left her home planet Earth. And there was a political revolution that gave rise to some state capitalist government called the corporation, who largely see themselves as progressive technocrats who start violently suppressing the cultural traditions and life ways of the indigenous in order to advance technologically. And the main character, Sudi, ends up having to play the role of ethnographer to document the now endangered cultural practice called the telling instead. I don't want to give away any, too many spoilers for anybody who might read it, but it's, it's a really wonderful story. And it's a kind of parable of the uh, uh, suppression of Taoism by the Chinese government during the communist revolution under Mao in the 1960s. Okay, so next item is paganism. I'm not a pagan myself, but I do think it's fun to think about. I'm also not terribly well read on the subject, so I, I don't want to say anything uh, to be disrespectful for people to people who who identify as pagans. But um, in my first few years of college, I, I got really interested in, to, in Germanic mythology for a while. I even collected river rocks and made my own runestones with a Dremel. You know, it's like a rotary tool used for uh, grinding and sharpening, engraving or polishing. Uh, anyway, I, I enjoyed. At the time, I enjoyed imagining you know, that my ancestors were telling these stories to their kids, not as myths, but as religion, as allegories and parables. You know, it can be really fun reimagining the world in this way. In the Germanic mythology, there are nine worlds, I think, each inhabited by different beings, I mean, elves and dwarves and humans and such. It's fun to redraw the map in your head of the world around you and repopulate it with new and unfamiliar creatures and sources of power, you know, sources of power outside of capitalist modernity and, uh, you know, uh, playfully return to some kind of heroic society where governments are basically weak or non-existent and society is organized around like warriors and their loyal retainers and where relationships between societies are shifting between alliances and rivalries and basically, you know, significant portions of the economy are made up of uh, competitive gift exchange and one-upsmanship. I mean, uh, you know, these are the kinds of societies that uh, are the origins of these particular myths or the origins of like uh, Germanic mythology in particular. But uh, it also <laughs> it also reminds me of something that Graeber said in Bullshit Jobs or maybe Utopia of Rules that uh, make believe play is the purest expression of freedom as opposed to make believe work, which is the purest expression of unfreedom or the lack of freedom. And so... Uh, in hindsight, I think some of my own indulgence in paganism or Germanic mythology was a kind of make-believe play, you know, a pure expression of freedom for myself. Cool. All right, next item is poetry. Uh, let's see. One of my favorite poems is Out of the Darkness by Voltaire de Clare. It's in a wonderful collection of poems, essays, and sketches and stories she wrote that were, that were published by Aki Press a few years ago. I don't read a lot of poetry. I did when I was younger. When I was in high school, I used to skip class and go to the library. I loved reading Whitman and Emerson. Leaves of Grass was my favorite at the time. I would sometimes sneak out of the library and go sit under a tree. Um, I did this pretty often until I got caught by my English teacher, ironically enough. I was sent to the principal's office and was threatened with truancy, and uh, I ended up dropping out of high school a few months after that. I hated school. Damn. Um, Getting in the way of your education. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, Le Guin actually has a great essay called Stress Rhythm in Poetry and Prose, where she explains the differences between the two. Essentially, they differ in the frequency and regularity of stress. Uh, in poetry, there's often only one unstressed syllable between stressed ones, and usually no more than two. Prose often has three or four unstressed syllables, um, and if you say more than four unstressed syllables in a row, you're mumbling. And uh, anyway, she goes on to say more about meter, but I would just recommend your audience who might be interested to uh, read the rest in her book called uh, Wave in the Mind. Uh, and anyway, as I said, I don't really read a lot of poetry now, but I do appreciate the poetic style of a lot of my favorite writers, including Le Guin. Another favorite is Wallace Stegner, the so-called Dean of Western Literature. His book, The Big Rock Candy Mountain, is my favorite novel of all time, and I highly recommend All the Little Live Things and Crossing to Safety. I think your audience might especially appreciate his book, uh, Joe Hill, about the IWW labor activist and singer-songwriter. Cool. So the last item on the lightning round is 
the coffee shop hypothesis, <laughs> a beginner's guide to epistemological pragmatism. I think you're referring to a pleasant conversation we had a couple months ago when I came and visited you, where we were talking about how when trying to, that we, that you essentially use rationalism and empiricism to arrive at useful conclusions when, you know, going out for coffee. Oh, that is possible to. Right. Yeah. I think the example we had was you and I are sitting across from each other. We're having a conversation and I'm talking, but maybe I, I've been going on for too long. I've been running my mouth and I start to notice you, you know, shifting away and looking, uh, looking around in a sort of, you know, distracted way. Mm -hmm. uh, and you're maybe twiddling your thumbs and maybe even looking at your phone every once in a while. And all, all these are signals to me that Sensory data. Yeah, this is all sensory data, and it's all, these are all cues to me that I'm being discourteous, mm -hmm. right? I'm not considering, uh, I, I failed to realize until now that... You come to the knowledge that it is a possibility that I could be uninterested <laughs> right. in, that, in that example. And so that's an example of empiricism. Yeah. Okay, another, while you're at a coffee shop, I'm sorry, I'm cutting you yeah. off. The other way is rationalism. Right. You can use to arrive at something that we can call knowledge. Right, um, so that like... And the same example, you and I go to the coffee shop, or maybe we get uh, we go somewhere where they give us the receipt at the end of the meal, the bill to pay at the end of the meal, and we both see the number. It's fifty dollars. Real, this is the best coffee in town. It's fifty dollars. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, you know, we know rationally that you know equity would be half. If the goal is equity. If the goal is equity, then to, to split the number on the receipt in half would be right. equal for both of us. So we both rationally come to the conclusion that we each pay $25 in order to have an equitable outcome for, for both of us. Mm -hmm. But this is an abstraction of sorts, you know, like this is a, we're, we're using our rational minds to come to these conclusions rather than sense data, mm -hmm. you know. So it's possible to use both empiricism and rationalism to come to different things that we can call knowledge, thus demonstrating that pragmatism is actually the true position. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I may be mistaken in my understanding of pragmatism, but I, I, I consider myself a pragmatist and in this way that in both of these examples, we're able to come to useful conclusions to guide our actions. In the first case, I realize I've been going on for too long and I wrap up whatever I'm saying and I express interest in you. Joel, I'm, you know, what, 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 what's going on in your world? Like, mm -hmm. what, what have you been doing lately? How's work? How's your family doing? Or, you know, are you writing any music lately that you're excited right, about? Right. right? Yeah. To show you that I've, I recognize that I've done you th th this courtesy sure. going beyond. Sure. And the other case, yeah, we both pull out our debit cards, throw them both down on the, on the bill. And uh, when the waiter comes by, we basically, we both say, Hey, yeah, down the middle or something. Yeah. The coffee shop hypothesis, a beginner's guide to epistemological <laughs> pragmatism, demonstrated, proven, it's over. It's, over. it's done. <laughs> we figured it out. We don't have to talk about it anymore. You know, just like default to this and we can move forward. All right. So uh, we have a, a couple listener questions and then we can, we can move to the end here. Uh, the first listener question is, of course... How can I get a cappuccino in your imagined political utopia? Well, if you're coming with me, uh, you probably have got to go walk away and get one at the Belt and Braces. This is a reference to uh, Cory Doctorow's book, Walk Away. The Belt and Braces is like this. It's, it's basically a gift economy tavern where, mm. where workers earn the right to pitch in. They have jobs, or they call them commits, and uh, they're flexible. I mean, from, from day to day, workers compete for the best ones available and commits are visible to everyone on a leaderboard and the leaderboard displays people's tabs so it's clear how much you're taking versus how much you're giving back and there's all sorts of social pressures that keep workers from coveting jobs or from looking down their noses at slackers or from lionizing somebody who's slaving away and uh, you know all work is it's supposed to be emergent and asking somebody if you can pitch in is is in some sense telling them that they're in charge and you're deferring to their authority if you want to work, you just do something. And if it's not helpful, somebody else will probably undo it later or talk it over with you or let it slide. And, uh, yeah. Cool. So, oh, actually, we just had a, a question come in. Here, one sec. Okay. 
So this is the listener question that just came in. Fresh off the press. Fresh off the press. <laughs> Why are you a dumb... Hold on. Hold on. <laughs> Why are you a dumb motherfucker? <laughs> <laughs> and why do American men like us have to couch our affection for each other in insults? <laughs> why can't we just be tender with one another? <laughs> um, why you dumb motherfucker? Pause. Yeah. Why do we have to preface it with insults? Man, um, I'm probably so dumb because of... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Two separate questions there, huh? <laughs> Uh, why am I so dumb? Probably because I have like a really big head and it's mostly full of air. <laughs> and uh, I have to couch my affections and insults because I have a really tiny heart. And most men <laughs> have little, little teeny tiny hearts and their big stupid chests are you know, <laughs> covered in carpet. And, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Self-deprecation. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You know what? You can't... Um, in general, I think it could be hard for some people to express love and affection directly. Sort of in the same way, it could be hard for some people to voice criticism and frustration. And I think teasing is a way to do both in a way that's more comfortable for both people. And it also implies trust. I mean, telling somebody you love them directly is unambiguous, right? But telling them in some silly or absurd indirect way implies that you both trust each other enough for the intended message to be received. That... You both know each other well enough to know what's actually being expressed. And, and this is also true of just doing something as an act of love rather than saying it outright. I think probably our most important expressions of love and affection are often expressed in these indirect sort of ways. Yeah, that was good. And I think Clay's going to like it too because he's the one that, that uh, suggested the question. <laughs> okay, so this is the last listener question. What video games are most pertinent for non-Servium listeners to play uh <laughs> well first of all capitalism is a game that most of us can never win right so it's important that we play games that we can uh, so uh, hyper light drifter is is one of my favorite games of all time uh, i played it for the first time back in 2016 um, i played it once more a couple years later and i've watched a few friends play it a few times since it has an incredible depth of lore that you might miss playing through the first time it's an action adventure role-playing game developed by heart machine and it's basically a 16-bit retro cyberpunk version of The Legend of Zelda mixed with like a dystopian, low-life, high-tech version of Diablo. Mm -hmm. One of the game's lead creators, Alex Preston, said it was inspired by Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind. I just learned this recently. I thought it was really interesting. There's no dialogue in the game. The story's told entirely through visuals and music, but it's a really epic story still. And the score was composed by Disasterpiece, who writes a lot of chiptune, uh, electronic and ambient music. In fact, before I ever even played the game, I watched the trailer at least a dozen times. The graphic design, it's stunning. It's, hmm. it's high pixel art. And I actually have a couple pieces framed at home. The music, though, that's what kept bringing me back. The song featured in the trailer, Panacea, it's one of the most beautiful songs ever. You have to listen to it. Okay. It's like Cloud Debussy meets Vangelis, or uh, Claire, Claire de Lune meets Blade Runner Blues. Uh, another one of my favorites is Titan. It's super epic and haunting. I like to listen to the album at night sometimes with a book or a cocktail. And it maybe sounds kind of silly, but it brings to mind images of, and fantasies of like a, some sort of crypto-anarchist revolution. Cool. <laughs> Badass. <laughs> so if that proves to anyone that with all that said, you probably don't arrive at the end of the day to primitivist conclusions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, John Zerzan, he doesn't arrive at the right conclusion. I don't think he actually has much in the way that, that that's useful for humans. John Zerzan seems to think the perfect form of non-alienation for humanity is some kind of perfect ape where, you know, nothing is mediated and, uh, you know, we're basically, where we're sort of like telepathically uh, in tuned with, with nature. I think he's gone as far as to say that like, you know, all forms of art and music are alienating. So, yeah. Where should folks go if they want to learn more about some of the stuff we've discussed today or just to maybe interact with you about some of the stuff that we've discussed today? Well, I don't post much on social media, so I can't recommend anybody to follow me there. I'll be releasing an album soon, so anybody who might be interested in that, you know, they, they might tune into Twitter. I'm, follow me on Twitter. I've got an account there under Travis Halton. 
As far as other sources for some of the stuff that we've talked about today, I highly recommend reading David Graeber and David Wingro. Most people tuning in probably already know David Graeber. And if you haven't already read his works, uh, many of them are available online for free. Um, but you can probably find some of them in your local bookstores and libraries. David Wingro is a professor of comparative archaeology at the London School of Economics. David Graeber was a professor of anthropology there until he died last year. They have a new book coming out called The Dawn of Everything. They worked on it together for about 10 years. And it may be already out by the time this episode is released. But mm. I attended a webinar recently hosted by the London School of Economics where Wingro talked about the book. And I think your audience might find it very interesting. One of the essential topics of the book is about inequality. It's not so, so much about the origins of inequality, but about how we got stuck. Essentially, humans have been self-consciously experimenting with different forms of political organization for thousands of years. They had been moving back and forth between forms of egalitarianism and structures of hierarchy, and in many places seasonally within the same year. And I think this is particularly important to reflect on in terms of what it means for anarchism. If you're an activist, if you're interested in anthropology, and maybe you're thinking about graduate school, I recommend checking out the Activist Anthropology Graduate Department at the California Institute of Integral Studies. As far as I know, they're the only department entirely committed to working alongside social movements and researching the harms and limits of capitalism. You can also follow them on Instagram. Uh, I think their handle is at A-N-T-H-C-I-I-S, um, anthesis for good memes. <laughs> if you want to network with anarchist archaeologists or provide financial assistance to archaeology students in need, uh, I recommend checking out the Black Trial Collective. They have a microgrants program, mutual aid pool that you can donate to. The microgrants are for archaeological students in need, and they prioritize the funds for black and other uh, marginalized or underserved communities. You can follow them on Instagram at black underscore trowel underscore collective. If you live in Houston and you're a parent or planning to have kids, I recommend checking out the Sudbury School um, as an alternative public school or other private school options. And if you live in Texas and are interested in learning about your local ecology and getting involved with projects like habitat restoration, wildlife surveys, and public outreach and education, I recommend reaching out to your local Texas Master Naturalist program and maybe becoming a volunteer with your local chapter. Cool. Well, Travid Halton, I really appreciate the conversation. I appreciate you coming down here to record this with me. It's been very insightful and thoughtful and illuminating, and I think it's going to put a lot of rocks in lots of people's shoes. <laughs> so thank you. Well, thank you for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Well, let's, uh, let's, go, get, uh, let's go get some food. That sounds good. <laughs> Thank you everyone for tuning in. We hope you enjoyed the conversation. We're going to go ahead and leave you with one more of Travid Halton's songs from his upcoming album titled Obsessions. The song is called The Great Remembering. Bless.
kissed the bones before they bled away. She flew back to the field where the strangler choked the air with poison for the thieves who would feed upon the bone his crops would bear. She perched upon a bough and let out a solemn call. She told him of his wrongful ways and warned him of his fall. I don't give a damn, he said, this land belongs to me. His teeth dug deep in the forbidden fruit from the consecrated tree. Soon, someday he'll die He slashed and burned the forest When he picked up the plow He forgot where he came from But he remembers now Down by the creek where the gentle water flows Swallow in that scourge that seeps through the soil deep below The taker knelt beside the stream to wash his savior's band When a snake slithered softly toward his feet and struck his sinful hand Startled he stood and stumbled back before he fell into the creek. He hid his head and went to sleep under the spell. And there on the bank, near their bones beside the tree, was glistening under the sun the cross that set him free. He slashed and burned the forest when he picked up the plow. He forgot where he came from, but he remembers now. There it is, folks. I hope everyone enjoyed this installment of the show. If you liked this episode, be sure to check out our full catalog at nonserviamedia.com or at youtube.com slash nonserviamedia. And make sure to subscribe to receive notifications each time we release a new episode. If you're interested in seeing this project continue, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash nonserviamedia. And if you can't contribute financially, you can help us out simply by liking and sharing this episode. As usual, shout out to our existing patrons, 
Your support helps us reach a larger audience and helps keep this project going. Finally, be sure to keep an eye out for the next episode. Thank y'all so much for tuning in. We'll talk to you soon.